Aloha and welcome to another edition of Condo Insider. You know, in Hawaii, about a third of our population lives in an association such as a condominium. And this is Hawaii's show about association living and education. I'm Richard Emery, I'm your host. I do want to remind you that anytime you can call our hotline with questions at 415-871-2474. We're privileged today to have a really good friend of mine, a person I have a lot of respect for, John Knorik, a local Thanks, labor attorney who's been around the industry a long time. We're going to talk about some recent changes in employment law and some of the risks of living in an association and employing people. But first, John, welcome to the show and tell me a little bit about your background. Thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, I've been practicing law in Hawaii for about 35 years, only representing employers. Uh, a large part of my practice is working with associations, condominium associations, and I've been enjoying it. Uh, unfortunately, for a lot of employers in Hawaii, the, the laws have gotten more complicated, the rules keep changing, and liability keeps increasing. So it's important to stay on top of the law so that you can avoid the kind of expense and liability that come with hiring lawyers and try to avoid that. And having been in the management business for a long time, as you know, it can be very expensive if you do it wrong. Well, and, we all uh, have to make a living somehow, but... <laughs> and tell us about your firm. Uh, Torkelson Katz is a, a general business practice firm. About half of the attorneys there do nothing but management labor law, but we do have attorneys that are skilled in tax, real estate, healthcare law, uh, corporate issues. So uh, we have a general business practice as well as a specialty in employment law. And while I have you here, I do want to ask you to tell about the thing you do every year, the Chamber Desk Manual. Ah, what that you. is and what it is about. So well, I know it's part of your community service in a way. So thanks for share with that. Uh, one of the things that uh, the firm does is publish something called the Chamber Desk Manual on Employment Law. This is the, the current issue. And what it is, is it's a summary of all the employment laws that apply to Hawaii employers, both federal and state. Uh, we've tried to condense the law and put it in short chapters that give you the basics, explain how to comply with the law, and answer some questions. And if this doesn't answer your questions, then you can call us. But we, we also put on an annual seminar that introduces the new edition of the desk manual every year. That one this year is August 18th. So keep track of Chamber of Commerce announcements for that seminar if you're interested. So hypothetically, if I had one of those five years ago and that one, would this weigh more than the one? Yeah, the current <laughs> ones weigh a little bit more. We, yeah, I mean, we seem to be adding a chapter every year, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, as with many things, the, the law does change. It evolves over time. And as you probably know, there are new protected categories. There are new rules on compliance. And so you really need to stay up to date on it. One of the most Im important things I read about recently was where President Obama signed into uh, a, a rule, a new federal rule, federal regulation on overtime, which could have a big impact on associations because it changes the threshold from when you have to pay overtime and not pay overtime. Tell us a little bit about that. That's right. That's right. So the Fair Labor Standards Act is the federal law that regulates wage and hour payments for most businesses. Um, there are jurisdictional standards. There has to be about a half a million dollars worth of inflow and outflow of, of money from an entity to be covered as an enterprise under the Fair Labor Standards Act. But there's alternate tests if an individual is buying and selling product through the uh, interstate commerce, there's coverage. Basically what the Fair Labor Standards Act is, it sets a minimum hourly wage rate for employees. Right now Hawaii is higher than the federal, so the Hawaii law applies. But it also regulates when overtime has to be paid to employees. And overtime under federal law has to be paid to any employee who works over 40 hours in a work week. Every company has the right to set a seven day period as a work week. But within that seven days, anybody who works over 40 is entitled to time and a half for each hour over 40. Now, to be exempt from that, you can fit into a number of specialty categories, and these are generally called the white-collar exemptions. Most condominium associations have looked at the resident manager or site manager as an exempt salaried employee. They'll pay them a salary, they have executive functions, they hire and fire uh, employees, they make important decisions on behalf of the association. To meet that test, that executive exemption test, they have to supervise two or more full-time employees, however. So small condominium associations that have no other employee than their resident manager would never make this uh, test. 
but those that have several employees could meet the test provided that that resident manager is salaried at a high enough level. Up until, recent, up until these new regulations uh, were issued, um, that salary was roughly $23,000 a year or 400 and some dollars a week. Uh, that wasn't difficult to make uh, an exemption. However, um, the federal regulations have recently been changed and the base salary that you have to pay a resident manager to be exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act overtime obligations is going to rise to $913 a week. And that's exclusive of housing. You cannot consider the value of housing or any other benefits provided to an employee to make that $913. So if, in fact, you have a small association or even maybe a medium-sized association, that manager is subject to overtime if he's not making $46,000 a year. It'll be 49000 and some dollars. Okay, $49,000 a year. And even though that association may give them a free apartment, may pay the utilities and the telephone and electricity, that does not count against the $49,000. That's $49, correct. So if you're an association and you have that situation, uh, are there record-keeping requirements, things they have to do to, to validate that, or can you just say, well, he just never works more than 40 hours? Well, one of the obligations that come with all employees who are not exempt is that you, as an employer, have the responsibility to make sure you accurately record their daily hours worked. Not weekly, not monthly, and it's not the employee's burden, it's the employer's burden to make sure that they accurately track daily hours worked. Now, most businesses are going to trust employees to accurately write down their time and then have it reviewed. But that's something that has to be worked out between the association and if they have a property manager to make sure that the, the hours recorded accurately reflect the hours worked by that resident manager. So in theory, since it's the employer or the association's responsibility, if a manager said I was working overtime and the association didn't keep records, the law is probably, or this, the government authorities are probably going to side with the employee because you didn't do what you're supposed to do. Uh, apparently you've been here before, so you actually know that's exactly what the Department of Labor or the courts will do. That if the employer failed to keep accurate records and the employee says, well, I worked overtime 10 hours a week, unless you can prove they didn't, the courts are going to accept the employee's representation. But as I understand the standard, it's 40 hours per week. Correct. So if, in fact, you had a plumbing leak and the guy worked 12 hours one day, which is four hours over eight hours, uh, but you gave him compensatory time during that same week so that his total for the week was 40 hours, then overtime wouldn't be due. That's correct. But remember, the Department of Labor, both state and federal, look at this on a week-to-week -week basis, not any larger period of time. So there is absolutely no legal basis for comp time that extends beyond a one-week period. So, even, so even if the employee agrees to comp time, it doesn't make any difference. Outside, still outside of government work, there's no comp time. Wow. Well, this could be a really big issue for associations in planning their budget because, to, to me, from my own personal experience in running associations, the probability is that most managers are working a 40-hour week, and most managers may or may not have some housing al allowance and they're going to exceed, um, they can pay them less than 46000 It's just they have to pay the overtime over forty. That's it doesn't correct. give them that mandatory $49,000, you got to pay that. It's just saying if you're not making that much, then the overtime uh, take, takes effect. So they could be paying less and still not have to pay additional money so long as he doesn't work overtime. But if they don't keep the records, they're exposing themselves to big liability. Yes, and I've had many cases hap uh, occur where there are oftentimes a point in a relationship where the association wants to let the resident manager go. It's either not working out or they're looking for something different. And it's at that time that that resident manager pulls out their little notepad and says, well, before you fire me, I worked these overtime hours the last five years and this is what you owe me. And so we have this issue come up regularly. So it's important for associations to understand who's exempt, who's not exempt, and if they're not exempt, make sure they're tracking those hours. A simple thing to do is to make sure that the resident manager fills out a daily timesheet, signs it, and has it reviewed by somebody. 
Well, I know in, for example, the managing agent, the management company itself, they may have community managers who manage five or six or 10 properties who may be making less than 49,000 per year and really indirectly or somewhat consulting for the board or mm -hmm. providing some supervision for the resident managers. Is this gonna to apply to them as well? Yeah, sure. Every employer is responsible for tracking accurate hours if they're not exempt. So uh, no matter what industry you're in, you're going to have to look at all of your employees. And most large organizations that have had this issue and have, have looked at it going forward have said, how many of our employees are in this gap between 23 and 49 or 50 as we expected? A and how many hours are they working? Are these positions that are working overtime have we, that we've been treating as exempt and expecting them to work 50 hours a week? If they are, do we want to raise their salary or are we going to bite the bullet and just pay the overtime? So most big organizations have already reviewed their workforce, tried to figure out how they're going to address this increase in the minimum salary uh, to maintain exempt status. Well, speaking from experience as a management company executive, this, this will have an impact on some managers who work for these management companies because I know and uh, we used to have a company motto in our company and every Friday we'd all get together and say, thank God it's Friday, only two more work days until Monday. <laughs> you know, because it's, it's, it's an it's a unforgiving business a lot of way, handling these many associations that have problems sure. day and night. And so I can see the management companies are going to have to carefully review this particularly new rule and regulation sure. to make sure that they don't put themselves at risk in, 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 for that type of a situation. And, and there's a lot of employees that are voluntarily willing to work extra time without pay, but they can't do that without incurring liability for the company. You'll have a, an employee that just understands that it takes extra hours to work and they don't really are, they're not really asking for that overtime, but it is a legal obligation. And if things go sour in the relationship, they have a legal right to that and can make that claim. So you want to make sure that you either regulate the hours, people don't work over 40 in a work week, or if they do, it's recorded and you pay time and a half for each hour over 40. Well, this is very fascinating, but we're going to take a very short break and we'll be back with John Kenorick in just a minute. Aloha. We invite you to join us on our Keys to Success show, which is live on the Think Tech live streaming network series weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. My name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Our goal for our weekly show, Keys to Success, is to provide professional and personal development tools and profound insights on how to achieve success in life, career, and or business. We have a theme focus for each show, and our guests have achieved success in their life, career, and our business. They are frank and candid with their advice and commentaries. As this is a live show, we have live mess-ups as well, which are fun to watch. As you see. <laughs> Resources, success tips from our guests, and other information can be accessed at newmanconsultingservices.com or danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A dot org. We also invite you to call us to join our weekly conversations or tweet us if you have any questions or comments. We want you to participate in the show. I'm Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. And I'm John, the other half of the duo. We're looking forward to seeing you on our next Keys to Success show, aired live Thursdays at 11 a.m. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're sitting here with John Kenorick talking about the new federal regulations on overtime, of which the short message is if you're not making about $47,000 a year, excluding compensation for apartments or utilities, whatever else a manager might get, it's critical that the association maintain hourly employment records because that employee would be eligible for overtime for over 40 hours in a work week and it's up to the employer to maintain those records. But I can see some associations right now thinking, I know how to get around this. We're going to make him an independent contractor. Okay. We're going to sign an employment contract. We're going to provide him no benefits whatsoever. And we're just going to pay him a flat amount of money. And he can pay the taxes and get his own medical. Maybe we'll give him medical as a side benefit as an independent contractor. We're going to have him an independent contractor. Is that going to work? Well, independent contractor status is really complicated and it is very disfavored under most laws. The employment laws in Hawaii and under the federal government uh, generally make it very difficult to establish independent contractor status. For purposes of wage and hour law, 
what the federal government looks at is what's the economic reality between that individual and this entity? Who is this person economically dependent on for their livelihood? And one of the things they're going to look at is who do you perform services for? If you're only performing work for one person or one company or one association, you're going to be deemed an employee because you're economically dependent on that person. On the other hand, if I am provi providing services for 20 different companies, then I can argue that, listen, I'm in business for myself. I'm taking all the risk. I'm not dependent on any one customer. I'm going around and doing work for a number of different entities. And that helps. One of the things the State Department of Labor does is look to see whether you have a website. So how many resident managers do you think have websites that says, I am an independent contractor and I will provide resident manager, manager services for a number of companies? They don't do that. So the reality is, for wage and hour purposes, it's highly unlikely to ever be able to establish independent contractor status for a resident manager that works pretty much full time for you. You know, frankly, uh, again, having been in the industry for a long time and, and kind of paralleling this federal regulation, I've taken over many projects and I go in and I see it's a very small project and they just hire someone as an independent contractor. They say, well, we didn't want to be burdened with all the taxes mm -hmm. and burdened with all the work comp and burdened with all of the mm -hmm. medical insurance if they work more than 20 hours. And I've always thought this was a, a huge risk for an association. Frankly, I would always refuse to take the association on as a client unless they agreed to put that person on payroll. You're probably very smart there because the association could have extreme liability, not just for wage and hour, but for injuries or illnesses that that employee has. We have two other laws in Hawaii that create a lot of protection for employers and also create a lot of liability if they don't comply with those laws. One is our workers' compensation law and the other is our prepaid health care act. Our workers' compensation law says that if you get injured in the course of your employment, workers' compensation is the exclusive remedy for you. And while you buy insurance to cover that employee's lost work time and medical costs, that's a lot cheaper than getting sued for that injury if that person believes you were negligent in creating a hazardous work environment for them. So workers' comp is a good protection for employers for employees. Trying to establish independent contractor status under workers' compensation law is even harder than under wage and hour law. The, the test is the relative nature of work test, and it's a little complicated, but it generally means that if you provide any service that adds to the product or service that that entity is providing, then you're an employee. Prepaid health is worse. Prepaid health has something called the ABC test, and our Prepaid Health Care Act says if you get injured, for any employee who works 20 or more hours a week for four consecutive weeks, I have to provide you state-approved health insurance that covers your medical costs. Now, if I am not covered because you think I'm an independent contractor and I have a heart attack and go to the hospital, how much do you think that medical bill is going to be after I get treated for a heart surgery? Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Guess what? If I have health insurance, that's going to cover most of it. If I don't have health insurance and I'm deemed an employee, you as the employer are liable for all those medical costs. You know, it's interesting you to say that because when I'm talking with a potential client about, uh, uh, and they have this independent contractor uh, arrangement, I say to them often, think of it this way. Your manager or your uh, maintenance worker is on a ladder and he falls and he breaks his back, he can never work again in his mm -hmm. life and you don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. Is his attorney going to agree with you, you have an independent contractor agreement, or is he going to go after that association? And those cost expenses and all that money for his future is going to come out of the association and out of future maintenance fees and expenses, yeah. you know, and uh, I don't know how they'd get around that. Well, Richard, you, you know that you would never advise a condominium association not to purchase general liability insurance, right? Right. So why? Because if somebody gets hurt on property, the damages are so high, it would be too costly. It's not prudent to do that. It's not prudent not to buy workers' compensation insurance to cover your employees' injuries. So to try to skirt the workers' compensation law or the prepaid health care act law in order to save a few dollars now is not fi fiduciarily proper or prudent. I think, uh, I, I believe I'm correct on this, even under the workers' compensation insurance, there's a rider 
for uh, independent contractors per se, that because you could have people who legitimately come in and people challenge whether they are or mm -hmm. they are not, mm -hmm. that for I think it's about five hundred dollars a year, you can cover these alleged independent contractors. Yeah, I'm not sure what the cost is, but I know a lot of the work comp carriers will agree that if you've incorrectly classified somebody as an independent contractor and they make a claim and are deemed to be an employee, the work comp law will apply to them. But you need to buy the insurance. From your experience, and you've been around this a long time, where do you see the biggest mistakes boards of directors or associations make with employees? Well, that's, that's a broad category, but I, I think one of the difficulties most associations have is separating the condominium association management from running their own home. Um, we all look at our association, uh, the, where we live, as something personal. So if I get elected to a board, I'm getting elected because I live here, I have a particular pr interest in making sure where I live is, is a nice place to live and it's done right. And it gets kind of emotional sometimes. So sometimes boards look at issues not in a dispassionate business-like way, but too often well, I've tried to work with this person, I knew him, and he lied to me, so I want to fire him. I think it's really important for boards to think that their association is a little business, and if it were a business, you would look to your experts to get advice on how to do things. I'll turn to my accountant if it's a financial issue. I will turn to my property manager if it's some issue regarding you know, uh, the proper procedures to use for condominium decision making. And I might look to my lawyer if I've got a legal issue with regard to an employee rather than say, well, I ran my own business, I know how to deal with this. Well, it's not so simple. And I think boards need to exercise a little bit of caution when making decisions that have legal implications. I have to say, I've seen that many times, where boards get very emotional about this and, and they want to make a decision. And what happens in some cases, and, and this has always been confusing to me, by the way, is that they just go ahead and fire the person. They don't think it through. They don't get the professional mm -hmm. advice they should have. You know, and, and boards are judged by the business judgment. We're using independent professionals. But this word always seems to surface, hostile work environment. Sure. Is, that a, is there such a thing as hostile work environment? And there what is. is it? And well, well, first of all, there, the, the definition of a hostile work environment depends on what legal theory you're advancing. But in discrimination law is where a hostile environment evolved. And to the extent that the hostile environment is created because of actions or words used by coworkers, supervisors, board members, or the public that is based on a protected category, my sex, race, sexual orientation, national origin, ancestry, age, disability, credit history, arrest and court record, marital status, those are protected categories. If you make jokes about me, because of my ancestry, or you make jokes about me because of my religion, or you make comments about me because of, of that, that I find derogatory or offensive, at a certain point, that's actionable, hostile environment. And I can sue you for that under state and federal law. Outside of those protected categories, if I'm just an offensive person and I am writing you because I don't like the way you're doing your work, uh, and I think you're not listening to me, so I follow you around the property and I yell at you and I bring up at board meetings that you're an idiot and you should be fired and I'm, I'm, I'm making your life miserable at work. There's no cause of action for a general hostile work environment unless it's so outrageous that the general public would say no reasonable person should tolerate that behavior, which is possible. You can have an emotional distress claim or an outrage claim. But generally what's going to happen is your employee is going to stress out, go see their psychologist and say, I can never work in, proper, in, in uh, condominium management again and, and be treated under workers' comp or their health insurance for the rest of their life. And you as the condominium association employer are going to pay for that. You know, more times than not, I see what happens is that employee goes to the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. They file a claim which uh, costs them really nothing. Uh, the problem with that issue is they'll get investigated and oftentimes they want to settle. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with the board members all having to go to education, paying a small amount. Whether you're right or wrong, it makes no difference. 
that agency, rightfully so, is out to protect the, the working person. Yeah. And, and, uh, and it, it creates all this open problem where if you had simply got some professional advice and thought it through and took a deep breath, you can uh, avoid a lot of these types of issues. Well, you've heard the saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, and spending a little time and thought before acting, in, and it may mean spending a half an hour or four to 15 minutes with your attorney to review the facts, is worth that expense rather than defending a civil rights commission claim that has no basis because that will take tens and, or dozens of hours to defend and cost you that much more. Well, we want to thank John Kenoyk for being here today and we're going to ask you to come back. We only got touched the tip of the iceberg on employment law. We certainly learned today the importance of keeping accurate records and to make sure we qualify or follow the regulations with regard to overtime because the risks are very high. Don't try to circumvent it by using an independent contractor. Make sure you have workers' comp insurance and when required by law, prepaid health care insurance. And understand in a hostile work environment, we should treat our people with respect, with aloha, make sure they have a chance to be heard and use professionals at the end. So thank Perfect. you very much for being here today. We appreciate it. And next week, I'm actually going to be on vacation. So Jane Sugimura is going to be here talking about bidding and all the things you should go through on major project repair to do an effective job for your association and getting the best deal. And I'll be back the following week with some more interesting topics. So again, aloha, and thank you for watching Condo Insider every Thursday, 3 p.m.